Hello, my name is Christine Reedy. I'm faculty in the Department of Oral Health Policy and Epidemiology in the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. I'm a psychologist with a background in public health and I conduct research on behavioral strategies to reduce oral health disparities. My portion of today's session will expand on Dr. Tavares's comprehensive overview of the dental field's history and structure regarding dental care financing and workforce to focus on understanding how we measure access to and utilization of dental health services, why we care about and how we've attempted to solve issues of access, particularly for our most vulnerable citizens. Lastly, I'll revisit the medical dental divide and how we've attempted to build a bridge between these two professions. In order for us to understand how well we are doing with providing dental care to the U.S. population, it is important to look at what and how we measure use of dental services. In the past, when we considered the concept of access to dental care, the frame of reference was almost exclusively related to a patient's ability to obtain dental care. These were factors that were considered to be external to the patient, that is, the adequacy of the dental workforce and ease of finding a dentist and whether an individual had dental insurance coverage or could afford dental care. This was thought of as the supply side of dental access. Now discussions of access take into account factors internal to the patient, such as their perceived need for or want of dental care, their willingness to seek care, and their actual use of care that is available to him or her. Internal factors related directly to a patient's demand for care and may operate independent of the availability of that care. A focus on internal factors can become even more complicated as other factors can influence a patient's perceived need for care, such as oral health literacy. I will focus on the external factors as a way to frame the next topic on access and will present data on adequacy of the supply of dentists, who has dental insurance coverage, and who has visited the dentist. There is a serious concern that the U.S. dental care system and the availability of providers is woefully inadequate for a third of our U.S. population, according to a 2011 Institute of Medicine report. In 2007 data, comparing the number of dentists and physicians per 10,000 population, there is a variability across the states between the two provider groups. There are approximately four dentists per 10,000 in states Alaska and Mississippi, and eight dentists per 10,000 in Massachusetts. However, there is a three to four-fold increase in physicians compared to dentists across the states. Interestingly, within the District of Columbia, the numbers of dentists and physicians is the highest among all of the states. The distribution of dentists is a critical factor in the availability of providers, and if we were to move from our 30,000-foot view of the U.S. to looking down at individual states, we would observe areas of states where the supply of dentists is not evenly distributed, such as in rural areas. How does the population fare with regard to insurance coverage between health professions? Approximately 60% of the total population has dental health coverage, which actually seems pretty good. But let's put this into perspective by comparing it to the percent of the total population with medical health coverage. 84% of the total population has medical. In other words, for every one person without medical insurance, there are approximately three people without dental insurance. So we looked at whether the number of available dentists is adequate and whether everyone has dental insurance. The last external factor for measuring access that we will consider is who actually visited the dentist. Because of some of the policies instituted early on and previously described by Dr. Tavares, like the Early Periodic Screening and Diagnostic Testing, or EPSDT, the percentage of 2- to 17-year-olds who visited the dentist in 2011 was approximately 80 percent. As the population ages, we see the percentage who visit the dentist decrease. For ages 18- to 64-year-olds and ages 65 and over, 
approximately 60% in each age group had a dental visit in 2011. These data give us a glimpse into why the dental profession and some policies have begun to look at who is not going to the dentist and why. The landmark 2000 Surgeon General's report on oral health showed that vulnerable and underserved populations continue to suffer disparities in disease burden and access to needed dental services. So who are the vulnerable and underserved? According to the 2011 report, Improving Access to Oral Health, these include individuals who are made vulnerable by or underserved due to financial circumstances, insurance status, residence, health status, age, developmental status, chronic illness or disability status, and personal characteristics. So if we go back to looking at some of our access measures for specific populations, we find that access factors are not uniform. For data from 2007 insurance coverage of 21 to 64-year-old adults, low-income adults were less likely to have private dental coverage and more likely to have no dental coverage compared to all 21 to 64-year-olds. Only 15% of poor adults had private coverage and approximately 60% had no coverage compared to all adults in the same age group. In the same 2007 data, adults ages 21 to 64 without dental coverage were less likely to have a dental visit. Only 20% visited the dentist compared to almost 60% of private coverage adults in the same age group. This suggests that poor adults and most likely the working poor do not have dental insurance and because of lack of insurance do not routinely visit the dentist. This has implications for care seeking in other venues, something I'll mention shortly, as well as the impact on work productivity. As previously discussed, dental coverage is an important predictor of dental visits because dental insurance is usually acquired as part of a jobs benefit package, most individuals lose their dental coverage upon retirement. Medicare does not cover routine dental care for older adults, but provides for very limited medically necessary services. Thus, the elderly are vulnerable to issues of access to dental services. With less than a quarter of adults 65 years or older covered by private dental insurance, most dental care expenses in this age group are paid out of pocket. Not surprisingly, half of adults 65 and older with private insurance had regular six-month recall visits. However, for those who were uninsured, a higher percentage visited the dentist more than two years ago. All Medicaid-enrolled children are entitled to dental screening, diagnostic, preventive, and treatment services under Medicaid's EPSDT program. However, according to 2008 Medicaid administrative data, less than 40% of Medicaid-enrolled children had any dental care. This lack of utilization is troubling because untreated tooth decay can result in pain and infection that can affect children's daily activities, such as eating, playing, speaking, attention to learning, and missed school days. Medicaid has not been able to fill the gap in providing dental care to all poor children. In a recent year-long study, fewer than one in five Medicaid-covered children received a single dental visit. Although new programs, such as S-CHIP, may increase the number of insured children, many will still be left without effective dental coverage. This access issue is illustrated in one of the most high-profile and sobering cases of lack of access to oral health care. In 2007, 12-year-old Diamante Driver died after bacteria from an abscessed tooth traveled to his brain. His case demonstrates the multifaceted nature of lack of access. His family had lost its Medicaid insurance and had no other insurance. Dentists in the area who accepted Medicaid were difficult to find. 
His other sibling had several rotten teeth that needed attention.